It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Hoda Zugbi and um, Professor Harry Orr. Huda was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and due to civil war, uh, he, she had to move to the United States. She completed her medical degree in Mehari Medical College and fell in love with pediatric cardiology. She did then a uh, postdoc at Baylor College and to collect genes for uh, families of Rett syndrome. In 1988, she received her um, NIH grant to start her own independent lab. Between 1988 and 1993, Harry and Huda were collaborating and marching through genes. On April 8, 1993, they both discovered the disease-causing gene the same day, right in the middle of the candidate gene. In 1999, she also found the gene for Rett syndrome. Huda says she will not retire until she finds a cure for the disease that she is working on. Harry obtained his PhD in Washington University. He then moved to take up a postdoctoral uh, position at Harvard University in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. In 1981, he accepted an independent faculty position as a member of Immunobiology Research Center at the University of Minnesota. In 1993, he received the call from Huda, and um, they collaborate, and um, after a pause, he said yes, and then the collaboration and friendship uh, continued ever since. Currently, his group focuses on understanding pathogenesis in neurodegenerative diseases in general and ataxia, and also understanding contribution of molecular pathway altered in different brain regions affected by these diseases. Please join me in welcoming Professor Huda Zogbi and Professor Harry Orr. Well, thank you very much. I'm really deeply honored to join this year's laureates, thanks to the selection committee, and I'm very grateful for the wonderful hospitality we've seen both in Oslo and Trondheim enjoying this institute. So this is gonna be a little different. I'm gonna set this up a little bit, give you the very early background for five minutes. Step aside, Harry will share with you the mechanistic studies we've done on SCA1, and then I'll come back and share with you the work we've done on Rett syndrome. So bear with me. So I started, as you heard, as a pediatric neurologist, and it was encountering this beautiful little girl, Ashley, that really changed the course of my life. You see her here as an infant holding a book. She can flip through the pages, sitting straight. And then you see her at about two years of age riding a rocking horse. She could do all these things, use her hands effectively, but all of that lost when she turned a little over two. And you see her here wringing her hands. She was five. It was at this age that I met her. She lost language. She became socially withdrawn. And I'm going to show you now a video of another girl with Red syndrome just to see this syndrome in action. You see this consistent consistent, persistent hand wringing, uh, sort of autistic rocking activity, lack of really eye contact with the people around her. And here you see the challenge with motor planning. They have apraxia. While they have the motor strength, they can't really move. They're quite at steady, unsteady. And practically every part of the nervous system is affected in this disease. And I just happened to see within one week two girls with this, and I was convinced there's more, and the clinic volunteers pulled chart for me with the keywords that I gave them, and had six cases, wrote this up, and then patients started coming, and I decided I have to go to the lab to find the gene. And Art Boudet was kind to take me in his lab, but as you've heard, this was a sporadic disease, and this was 1985, genome unmap. He said, pick another problem. You can't work on this. So I picked spinocerebellar ataxia type 1. It's, he, he, he needed a Mendelian disorder to train me as a postdoc. He wasn't going to work with a sporadic disorder. So we picked this disease, which is rare, affects balance and coordination, eventually even the coordination of swallowing and breathing. There's, in the younger ones, there's mild cognitive deficits, and the disease is characterized typically by loss of Purkinje cells and brainstem neurons. People are affected in their 30s and 40s, often have kids before they know they have the disease, and sadly die 10 to 15 years after onset of symptoms. And I was fortunate that in Houston there was this large multi-generational family, and I was able to examine people in these four generations and talk to them about their parents and grandparents. And that's when I was struck that 
in these families, the disease started in the 70s in the great grandparents, and those lived into their 90s. And then in the parent in the 50s, living into 70s, and in them, it started in the 40s, and they were dying by 55. And then you can start seeing their children having an earlier and earlier disease onset to where here we have this child, she had disease at four years of age. And Harry had a similar large Minnesota family. And together, when he accepted the call, <laughs> we defined the region to be a million base pair. And a member of my family defined one boundary and a member of his family defined the other boundary. And as you've heard yesterday, when we decided to look for triplet repeats upon the discovery of the myotonic dystrophy gene, we divided the region in half, but kept 70 kilobases of overlap so that we don't miss it. And that's why we both found the gene. It was in the overlap region. And here you see the faxes we sent each other. These uh, were the ataxia families, and this is the Minnesota family. You see these expanded repeats. And the repeat is three bases, CAGs. This one, unlike Fragile X, it's within the part of the gene that makes a protein. So it encodes for glutamine. And this was the first ataxia gene to be cloned, so we called it ataxin 1, because the protein has absolutely no homology to anything, absolutely no knowledge about it, any domain or function. So ataxin 1 seems to be good. Now there are many ataxins. And there are over 200 ataxias, which a dozen or so of them, where the genes have been identified, but a dozen or so are in the repeat expansion category. So healthy people in this room typically have a 30 repeats. It could be as high as 38 and still healthy, but above that, that's what we see in SCA1. And remember this Texas family where I told you we've got people who had um, onset of disease in their 60s, they had 45 repeats, and here's the child with four repeats, uh, with 82 repeats, she had onset at four years of age. So very nice inverse relationship between repeat size and disease onset and severity. So you've found the gene, it's a glutamine expansion in a protein. 36 glutamine, you're healthy, 40 glutamine, you're not, why? And this is what Harry's gonna tell you. Okay. Um, so you can get sort of a flavor of our collaboration here. Um, I'm in the middle, which means I have to really behave myself time-wise, <laughs> or I get into trouble. So um, I first of all want to thank uh, the Kavli Foundation and everybody who's made my visit to Norway. And I should say, as somebody who comes from Minnesota, coming from to Norway is sort of like returning to home, I guess, even though I'm not Norwegian. <laughs> Uh, there's a very heavy Norwegian and Scandinavian population in, in Minnesota. So, you heard from Huda that how we cloned the gene, and one of the, the beauties of, for, for you younger people, of a collaborative effort is we spent a fair amount of time initially talking about who was going to do what as we moved forward, and divide and conquer, so to speak. So, um, you heard from Huda that in SCA1, a prominent site of neurodegeneration, and a, not only prominent, but consistent site of, 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 of loss of neurons are the Purkinje cells, um, which I happen to think is one of the most beautiful neurons in the nervous system. And um, a little aside here, they are so pretty, they often get on covers of journals. So, <laughs> if that's your area of interest, you might want to think about working on Purkinje cells or neurons. <laughs> so, in SCA1, if we look at the top, an individual about mid-course in their disease, and we look at their cerebellum by MRI, we see incredible atrophy. We see intercalation of the CSF between the lobules of the, Purkinje, of the cerebellar cortex. And this is largely due to atrophy and loss of Purkinje cells from the cerebellar cortex. Below, you see a, a, a sample of a post-mortem analysis of an individual who died with SCA1. 
and you can see a drastic reduction in, in the number of Purkinje cells as well as a, a severe atrophy of the dendritic tree of those that remain. So as after we clone the gene, we um, would like to obviously understand how does this protein function and how does the mutation cause the disease at, at a molecular level. And we reasoned that if we focused on a specific neuronal type that was particularly susceptible to SCA1, we might get to these answers to these questions quicker and, and perhaps more effectively. And so what we had, along with others, what we had developed in the lab was this regulatory region from a gene called PCP2 or L7 uh, from, from other labs that have been, has been, was shown to be a very effective regulatory element for overexpressing a transgene in Purkinje cells of the mouse cerebellum. And so we quickly generated a whole series of transgenic animals uh, using this regulatory element, uh, here is shown a, a, a line with the ataxin-1 protein with 82 glutamines. We also did controls with 30 glutamines and, and so forth. And you can see by this picture, this, a mouse expressing this transgene in its cerebellum has ataxia. Subsequently, individuals have done electrophysiology. Perhaps as another side note to the younger group, I when I was a graduate student, decided I was never going to do electrophysiology. <laughs> it was just beyond my skill set. So, and I've so far maintained that <laughs> in the lab. And Purkinje cells, as some of you may know, are spontaneously firing neurons, which is part of their very heavy energy requirements and so forth. And you can see uh, uh, the top tracing there is from a wild-type Purkinje cell, and below is a Purkinje cell expressing this transgene, a dramatic reduction in the spontaneous firing rate. Going to the MRI at the University of Minnesota, next door to my, my building is the Center for Magnetic Resonance, full of these magnets. And, uh, uh, and this is what you see by MRI and a one-year-old 82 glutamine transgenic animal. Again, severe atrophy of the cerebellum. And using calbindin as a Purkinje cell specific marker, like the human tissue at one year of age, a dramatic reduction in the number of Purkinje cells in the cerebellar cortex, as well as severe atrophy of their dendritic tree. So by these markers in, the, in this analysis, this transgenic model very accurately, we think, replicates the major features of this disease uh, uh, in, in the animals. So, here is a slide that summarizes 25 years of work by dozens of graduate students and postdocs and technicians from both labs. And this is what we think is the major pathogenic molecular pathway in Purkinje cells. Uh, uh, the ataxin-1 protein in the cytoplasm interacts with this chaperone protein, 1433, which is very important for stabilizing and preventing the, the uh, uh, degradation of the protein. Uh, this interaction is, is driven by phosphorylation at serine 776 in the ataxin-1 protein. And we use number, we're numbering the amino acids based on an ataxin-1 protein with 30 glutamines, okay? If we numbered based every time it changed the glutamines, it'd just be, it was chaos. So we quickly figured out we had to have a standard numbering system. The ataxin-1 protein is predominantly located in the nucleus of most cells, and in particular, Purkinje cells. And this is by virtue of a classic monopartate nuclear localization sequence, or NLS. So it transports into the nucleus where it interacts with several nuclear proteins. In terms of pathogenesis of Purkinje cells, the critical interaction is with a transcriptional suppressor called Capicua. So if we summarize this, the three bullet points that we think are critical at the molecular level for pathogenesis of Purkinje cells is entry of the protein into the nucleus, phosphorylation of the protein at serine 76, and the interaction of this protein with the transcriptional repressor, Capicua. But, as, you, as you've heard from Huda, 
SCA1 is not just an ataxia disease. It comes with decline in executive uh, cognitive functions, muscle weight, wasting and weakness, and difficulty in breathing and swallowing, which are actually thought to underlie the, the, under, the unremitting progressive aspect of the disease and lethality. And if you look, uh, you can see the ataxia 1 protein in RNA in a plethora of tissues in humans. So it's widely expressed. So as we were developing the transgenic model and working with it in Minnesota, Huda's lab was developing a model that, more, shall we say, more genetically is accurate in mimicking the uniform expression of, of the ATAX1 protein. So in this model, expression of the expanded allele is driven by the endogenous ATAX1 promoter. So it's spatially and temporally accurate by virtue of the fact that they inserted an expanded CAG repeat into the, into the coding exon of, of, of the mouse gene. And like the PCP2 Purkinje cell mice, these mice develop motor deficiencies as assessed by the rotor rod and various other tests. As we move to point two, you can see they're lethal. Um, it's, <laughs> it's very important, it, 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 I mean, let me rephrase that. They have a reduced survival. It, it's very important to understand that in a mouse colony, the mice typically die because the vet techs come up and say, you have, it's no longer humanely uh, 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 appropriate to keep these mice alive. So uh, it's, it's more of a survival curve than, than, than a lethality curve. And so you just have to, have to keep that in mind. It doesn't necessarily mimic what causes death, per se, in, 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 in humans. Um, they have a failure to gain weight, both the males and, and, and females, and you'll see the cognitive deficit as assessed on the Morris water maze. So they have a sp the spectrum, if you will, of phenotypes that are very similar to what we see in SCA1 patients. Now I want to move back to, to the rotor rod, and just for those of you who may not be familiar, and this is a HIPAA correct picture of a rotor rod experiment where we've blacked out the eyes so you can't recognize the mice that, have, that are facing you. So basically what you, our, our test is we do four trials, we do trials on four successive days. Each, each trial has a maximum of five minutes where we increase the speed of the rotation of the rod from four to, to 40 RPMs. And it's in the United States, I say this is very thin. I don't know if you have these lumberjacks here in Norway, and you do the log rolling exercise in water, where the lumberjack stands on the log and moves his feet real fast and rotates the log. Anyway, that's, a, I, that's how I describe this, this, this motor test to, to, to people in, in the United States. So the next thing I want to cover is the proof of concept of a therapeutic uh, a strategy. And, there, and all of our therapeutic efforts that are underway at this time to have a treatment that is disease modifying, okay, are based on reducing expression. Something's wrong, huh? Is this not? It's in my pocket. Is this better? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So why don't we just keep going? This isn't counting against Huda's time, right? <laughs> okay, is, is that any better? Okay. Let's see if I can get my coat on here. Thank you. Okay. 
So what, what this slide outlines is the, are the three targets where therapies or treatments are currently under uh, development. The first is in the nucleus using an antisense oligonucleotide RNase H based approach to uh, target the RNA as it's transcribed and then using RNA when you, when you have an RNA DNA uh, 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 duplex in the nucleus, it's very rapidly degraded by the endonuclease RNase H, the nuclease RNase H. The second approach is using a sort of, is a sort of a gene therapy approach, if, if you will, based on delivery of a micro or interfering RNA. In this case, the RNA target is a cytoplasmic RNA and uh, uh, using an endogenous cellular, cellular pathway, you get degra degradation with the interfering RNA binding to the, the RNA. You get degradation of the target RNA. The third approach is based on the phosphorylation story to develop inhibitors of the kinases that, that target this phosphorylation. In all three of these approaches are to reduce the ataxin one protein either by the amount of the messenger RNA or by increasing the endogenous degradation of the protein in the cells. And I should also point out that these are non-allele specific. They target both wild type and mutant ataxin 1 protein. So a challenge is to reduce the amount of ataxin, mutant ataxin 1 protein such that you have an effective alteration of the symptoms without reducing wild type protein such to a level that you have unwanted side effects. The ideal approach would be an allele specific one, but at this point in time we're working along the lines that are available to us. So let's look at the results of using an ASO. And this is done in collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals. I don't know if any of you know that it used to be ISIS. But for some reason, th that name was not associated with good health, and they changed the name of the... I have a confession to make. I have a pen in my bookcase that says ISIS. I stole it when I was there before they changed their name. Okay, so, so this is an ASO that now targets the mouse ataxin-1 messenger RNA in the 154 knock-in mice. And you can see that the motor performance in green, in, in green, the animals who get vehicle compared to the one in red have, have reduced, uh, 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 um, uh, I'm sorry, the ones, uh, the, the green are wild type that get vehicle. The uh, orangish ones are the, are the SEA knock-in mice that get vehicle. They take longer to cross the balance beam. And then we go start out with the mice with the 154 knock-in allele with the ASO, and they have essentially the same phenotype as the wild-type mice. On the right is, is the rotor rod data, where the ASO was given. It's given into the, in, into the lateral ventricle, so it has ASOs do not cross the blood-brain barrier, and they have to be uh, uh, injected directly in, into the CNS. And you can see significant improvement after a period of time. There's improvement in survival in these animals, but no impact on the failure to gain weight phenotype, okay? But clearly, uh, 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 we're now moving forward, as, as we'll come to in a minute, uh, uh, working with IONIS to, to develop uh, data that we can take the FDA for uh, uh, an IND using a drug targeting the human ataxin-1 message. So, shifting from history from past experiments to some ongoing experiments, we're using the knock-in mouse, mouse strategy to address what we think are two interesting fundamental questions. And we think the results of these, of these approaches will provide vi vital information for, for, uh, 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 that will help us in guiding treatments to ensure maximum efficacy. And the first is, to what extent does this Purkinje cell molecular pathway that I showed you does it replicate across other neurons in the CNS? And then the second approach is a, is a, is a new knock-in model that allows us to begin to delete the ataxin-1 gene from various regions of the brain, and actually from various tissues in the animal, to try to correlate the anatomical pathology with the development of the various phenotypes. So, very quickly here, uh, here's, our, here's our Purkinje cell molecular uh, uh, pathway. 
Uh, Huda's lab has used CRISPR-Cas to impact the serine 776 phosphorylation by changing the serine to an alanine. And she's, they see improved motor performance, for example, on the rotor rod. They see improved survival, about 20% increase, but no improvement in cognitive deficit and no improvement in the failure to gain weight. Using a similar strategy to mutate the uh, 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 knock-in ataxin-1 allele so that it can no longer interact with Capicua, also see motor performance improvement, improvement in survival, but again, no improvement in cognition or failure to gain weight. What we have done is use this, this approach, this CRISPR-Cas approach, to mutate the NLS, making the same mutation that we had done previously in, in, our, in our Purkinje cell-specific transgenic animals, and that is changing the absolutely required lysine at position 2 in the NLS to a 3 in This is a classic mutation that disrupts the ability of this NLS. It, it disrupts, it doesn't block this NLS ability to function and target protein into the nucleus. And we very cleverly, well actually the postdoc in the lab, very cleverly also in the process introduced an ALU restriction enzyme site without changing the coding sequence, so making it very easy to genotype these animals. So, when we look at the rotor rod, what happens now with this NLS mutation throughout the body. On the rotor rod, you can see the, the, the red is the, are the, is the KT animals, and the orange are the, one, the knock-in animals without the NLS mutation, and the green wild type. So not, naive animals at six weeks, we have not impacted their failure to perform on the, their, their decreased performance on the rotor rod. And we're intrigued what it looks like is these both, both knock-in animals, whether they have the KT or not, have a failure to learn on the rotor rod. But what we have very substantially altered is the age-dependent progressive loss of the motor performance in these animals. And that's shown on the second graph where we're looking at the performance at day four over progressive ages. We have a very substantial improvement in, in survival. By this calculation, something on the order of 90%, so almost doubling. It's, this is the most dramatic effect we've seen in survival. And we see a small but significant improvement in, in, in failure to gain weight. And a cognitive test that we do is, is we've done is the Barnes maze, and I'll move very quickly to the data and just looking at the cognitive score as assessed from, from how the animals look to seek to find the hole. What you see is that at seven weeks, there's really no difference in the two knock-in genotypes, whether there's the NLS is present or not. They're both perform less than wild-type animals. But sort of similar to the rotor rod data, as the animals age, the knock-in animals show a progressive loss in this capability which we uh, uh, have rescued in this KT mutation. So um, uh, we, we argue that the motor performance within these animals is improved. The premature lethality, that's probably a misstatement, shall we say survival. We have a 90% improvement in survival, and we're also seeing an impact on the cogn cognition and uh, uh, failure to gain weight. So we think the proper nuclear localization of the mutant protein is a critical aspect that drives pathogenesis of many of the SEA1-like phenotypes, and those listed here. And I would also add at this point, we, we argue that the ability to have such a substantial effect on the SEA1-like phenotypes by making single amino acid mutations in the proteins really demonstrates that it's the protein itself that's driving pathogenesis and not the RNA with the expanded repeat or RAN translation that you heard about earlier, which have been suggested as being potential pathogenic drivers. So let's quickly now move to some of the studies on looking at the anatomical basis for these, for these phenotypes. And so what we did was generate a second knock-in model. 
where briefly we, re we essentially replaced the two mouse coding exons, exons seven and eight, with the two human coding exons, which happens to be designated eight and nine because there's one more uh, 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 exon in the five prime untranslated region of the human gene than the mouse. The length of the repeat ended up being 146 glutamines. But what we did in this, in this mouse now is flank the coding regions of the, of the, that we inserted in with Cree recombination sites. And this is, first of all, because it's now the human coding region, and in, in here this is a platform for using various, testing various therapies that target the human messenger RNA and as well as if we're looking at anatomical characterization. So by gross obvious phenotypes, these, these uh, Nokian mice, like the previous Nokian mice, have two prominent phenotypes that we that associate. One is the uh, hind, clasp, hind limb clasp, clasping phenotype, and the other is kyphosis. And we'll come back to kyphosis in a minute. These mice show a, a motor performance deficit on the rotor rod, they show reduced survival, they show cognition deficits, and they show failure to gain weight. So very similar phenotypically to the, to the knock-in model that was generated in, in Huda's lab. So we're in the process of using a whole series of, of Cree expressing lines to begin to dissect the, the, the anatomical aspects of the various phenotypes. And what we'll talk about today is, a little bit is Nestin Cree that gets rid of the gene from all CNS cells, both neurons and glia. PCP2 Cree, which obviously takes it out of the Purkinjean cells of the cerebellar cortex. And then for the striatum, we're using RGS9 Cree. And then for skeletal muscle, we're using Acta Cree. So here is the rotor rod data comparing the 146 mice to wild type mice. Wild type on top. 146 in red, again, over several periods of time, and you can see consistent deficit. Here's what we get if we cross the 146 with Nestin Cree in blue. Improvement across all, all ages and, and time. So, okay, so, uh, you know, not surprising. You get rid of it from the central nervous system, and the rotor rod performance improves. Somewhat very surprising. We delete it from Purkinje cells. We see an improvement early on, but that improvement goes away as the animals age. And now we delete it from the striatum, the medium spiny neurons, and we begin to see significant improvement at the later ages. So this is telling us, at least in this knock-in model of SEA1, the, the motor, motor deficits are more complicated than just Purkinje cells in the cerebellar cortex and may involve the striatum. And it may not only, it may, it may also be time dependent in terms of as the disease progresses. So now let me quickly end here with the kyphosis and skeletal muscle. So um, this is my tape on the back slide which uh, um, David and I were discussing, there are some, some figures, some images, where you really don't need stats to show that, it's, you, that you believe it, that it's significant. And hopefully you can appreciate that, the, particularly at 50 weeks of age, in these images, the difference between the skeletal configuration, the spinal configuration of the knock-in mice below versus the wild-type mice up above. And in mice, a common cause of... Of, of kyphosis is loss of the th thoracic musculature. So, what happens when we knock it out in the act of Cree, which is now the middle series? We completely restore, we completely lose the kyphosis. Okay? Very, we would argue, demonstrating a direct muscle phenotype of presence of mutant ataxin 1. And this is further supported by analysis of, of directly the muscle morphology and, and, and ability to generate torque by our colleagues at, 
um, Michael Southern and, and Jim Ravasti. I know it says William, but William goes by Michael anyway. Any, so here at 18 weeks of age, you can see deleting the 146 allele from muscle with the Actacre improves things like muscle mass, uh, the torque, as well as, as uh, 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 fiber size. But what's really important is the number of fibers don't differ and not shown on this slide is that there's no central located nuclei in the, in the muscle. So no evidence for degeneration and we're really kind of intrigued with what's going on here. So, as we said before, we think a real critical aspect of the Purkinje cell molecular pathway that perhaps is replicated across multiple cell types and tissues is the importance of nuclear localization, proper nuclear localization. We think once in the nucleus, what the ataxin 1 protein interacts with may vary depending on the cell type or tissue type. It's not always capicula. And we think the, our, our, so far these conditional uh, uh, knock-in models shows a strong muscle pathology which has important implications for therapy because remember I said ASOs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if there's a real peripheral aspect to the disease phenotype, you have to take that in mind as, as the therapy is administered. We think the motor performance in, in, the, in these knock-in mice is more complex and perhaps involving both the cerebellum and the striatum and maybe additional brain regions. And thus we think this is a, these are, is a really a good model for beginning to dissect the phenotypes across the, the, the different, the, dissect the brain regional co contributions to the various uh, SCA1-like phenotypes. And so um, I'll stop there. This is the current team, uh, uh, collaborators, and of course the collaboration with Huda. Um, I'll get teary-eyed, so I won't go into it in any more detail than that. <laughs> so. I think we, we have one and a half minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> we, we spend some time and then, yeah, we could have. Um, I understand why you're using the antisense approach based on perhaps success of work at Cold Spring Harbor, but um, given the ubiquity of this gene product and the problem with antisense, have you, are people trying to do small molecule interventions that maybe disrupt the interaction between these factors? Well, yeah. That, so. You, you, David, you bring up a really critical point is, is the, the, the ASOs and the AAVs have important issues of, of delivery and distribution. Um, I will say that there is a peripheral ASO ch chemistry, so you can, you, we could, you, one could conceivably administer the ASO both centrally and, and, and peripherally. Um, in terms of specific mo small molecules, um, I think the, 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 the obvious one is the phosphorylation, and, and Huda's working with, with, with a company on, on that. Um, but there is, there is the issue that um, uh, uh, altering the phosphorylation by CRISPR wasn't quite as, as effective as uh, in the nuclear localization. So the treatment is, is offers some in potential improvement, but not perhaps... Uh, uh, it's going to take us a while. I guess what I'm babbling about is it's going to take us a while to find the ideal drug. Uh, wait a minute. Let me restate that. It's going to take you guys a while <laughs> to find the ideal drug. Harry, I have a really uh, general question. So you see cognitive decline in the patients, but I haven't seen that much other than cerebellar pathology. Is there a lot of pathology in the rest of the brain, and do any of the targets of ATAX and have anything to do with accumulating these yeah, things so the, like the, alpha the, and nuclein? Yeah, so um, one of the downsides of pathology in SCA1 is that Purkinje cell pathology is so prominent, the cerebellum becomes quite a major focus of pathological studies, is number one. And, um, you know, loss of Purkinje cells is so easy to detect from the cerebellar cortex, because they're in this nice row. Loss of specific neurons from more complex, more. Pe people have other cognitive problems, right? That are what, I'm not a clinician. 
So, so what I, how I understand it is it's a, a particularly what we call executive function. Uh -huh. So w one example would be word selection. They have issues with, and, and the other example that has, been re that has been told to me is that, say you have four errands to do, uh, you know, you would outline them that make sense going from store A to store B to gas station F or whatever, and then come home. Whereas if you're, if it would be much more random. In right. Terms of so that. these are either novel Sarah Beller? Front yeah, that that's way. the real issue is that, you know, Jeremy Schwaman at, at Mass General uh, has, has shown very nicely that the cerebellum the, the, the developed the concept of, of coordination of thought and the role of the cerebellum in many cognitive phenotypes. So trying to dissect out, and I think this is where our, our, our knock-in flocks mice will be really in, intriguing is, is in the area of cognition. Which of the cognitive deficits are due to perhaps cortical or hippocampal aspects of SCA1 pathogenesis versus which are the importance of the yeah, but cerebellum? It would also be interesting to know if any of the ataxin related RNAs have anything to do with some of these general properties of, uh, of uh, dementia. Yeah, so far we have not hit in on any of those with RNA-seq, yeah. And I think that's it, huh? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Harry, for representing both of us. So now we're going to go back to Rett syndrome. I had not forgotten while we discovered the SCA1 gene, and well, I wasn't allowed to work on it in arts lab. I was working behind the scenes on Rett syndrome. And remember, um, sporadic, but with time and patience, two such families came along, where these two half-sisters had red syndrome, but their mom was normal. And that led me to propose the hypothesis that this must be on the X chromosome, and the mom is healthy because most of her cells have healthy X, whereas her daughters have ra random X inactivations, therefore 50-50, 56 cells, 50 healthy cells, they have red. And let's use these two half-sisters and see what's being shared between their X chromosome. Maybe we can narrow the region. And to cut a long story short, another family came along, and then a family from Uta Frank and Carolyn Shan came along, then another one from Hopkins. That allowed us to narrow the region over a span of 10 years, really. It took <laughs> eight to 10 years to get these families to 10 million bases. And there it became sequencing gene by gene resolving the structure of every gene, sequencing it. And I give the biggest credit, because she did the lion's share of that sequence, to Ruthie Amir, who found the mutations in methylcytosine binding protein 2 on the X chromosome. And this is a protein that, uh, that was initially discovered by Adrian Bird as a protein that binds methylated cytosine. And as you know, this is an epigenetic mark that it can change the pattern of gene expression. And this protein can bind in this side. So this opened up really the way for us to understand Rett syndrome. And I'm going to tell you first, what did we learn when we found the gene? We learned that almost 95 to 96% of all Rett girls have mutations in this gene. I say the remaining 4%, it's somewhere in the gene that we haven't found it. These are all coding mutations. And this, typically, when you have half of the brain cell lacking a functional protein, you get classic Rett syndrome. We also learned that boys can actually have mutations in this gene, but they will die by typically two years of age because they'll have severe mutations and uh, they have many problems, so unfortunately they die prematurely. What's more recently we're learning is you can have a milder mutation, one that doesn't inactivate the protein completely. You can see here the protein is still in every cell. These are males, but these will present with mild learning uh, problems, and anyone, these are different colors because they're not all in the same patient. One may be autism, one may be bipolar, one may be schizophrenia. The point is these very, very mild mutations now don't manifest as Rett syndrome anymore, and the females with these mutations don't have any phenotype because they're mosaic. It's only the males will have these. So this is what we learned about the Rett side of things. 
The first thing we wanted to do is test if gene therapy will be a good approach, because RET is loss of function. So the first experiment we did, we added the human gene on a back with its all control elements, 90 kilobases, into the mouse to see as a positive control to a viral gene therapy. This really was a positive control experiment, and Collins did this in the lab. And these mice have twice the normal levels of MECP2, and what we notice is they have progressive neurologic problems. As you can see here, autism, all the features we see in RET, more or less, and including premature death. These mice died by one year of age. So that was really surprising and led us to think that perhaps humans that have a duplication of this gene might have disease. And in fact, we started seeing such patients, but Linda Vanesh reported a year after the mouse study on a series of boys that have duplications spanning the gene and they have a progressive disease. They typically inherit the duplication from their mom. The mom is asymptomatic because all of these moths have favorable X inactivation, so they don't express the duplicated allele. But the boys, unfortunately, have all the symptoms the same as we saw in the mouse, and they die typically by 20 to 30 years of age. And the one thing we wanted to know, doubling the protein, is that interfering with the function of the complexes as a dominant negative, or is it really a gain of the function? And this experiment says it all. When we do gene expression studies from either the null and the duplicated animal, we see the same genes misexpressed, but in opposite direction. What's down in the null, these are about 2,300 genes, What's down in the null is up in the duplication and vice versa. Therefore, the duplication is really a gain of the normal function of the protein. The More recently, we became interested, I mentioned to you about 4% don't have mutations in the, uh, in the coding region. We started characterizing the regulatory elements uh, that may regulate the expression of this gene. This gene is encoded by four exons. This is the three prime and translated region. This is an alternatively spliced exon. This is the promoter. This was characterized by Uta Franca many years ago, but we identified these additional peaks in the adult brain when this protein reaches an RNA, the highest level, and we asked, are any of these important to regulate the expression of uh, this gene. And uh, we made CRISPR deletion of each of those putative enhancers, and I'm just gonna ask you to look at this one here, where you see reduction. This is the wild, uh, this is the wild type level protein, and you'll see here the reduction by about 30%, and this other peak where you see the deletion result in an increase by about 50%. And it happens that those two enhancer elements are the only two in the mouse that are conserved in the human. We tested them in human neurons. So we decided to proceed and characterize the mice. And I'll summarize the data here. So 100% is the normal level of the protein. 50% is mosaic for RET. In RET, you see all these features. But when you reduce the protein by just 30%, now you only get a subset of the features that are more along the autism spectrum phenotype. Hyperactivity, anxiety, social deficits. So this is interesting for two reasons. It tells you there are probably people with mutations, males, that have very slight reduction in this protein who may present with autism spectrum disorder phenotype. And it also tells you not all proteins are equally sensitive to a slight reduction in the level of this protein. Some neurons are more sensitive than the other. That's why we see these partial phenotypes. And on the other side, the duplication mouse, the 200%, you see all of these features. But increasing by 50% give you, again, a subset with the learning and memory and social behavioral phenotypes. So if we were to put what we've learned from all human and mouse studies, loss, complete loss, is fatal in boys. Mosaics, severe Rett syndrome. We've also learned from mice that 50% gives you phenotype. And here's the mild phenotype with 30% reduction. And then the 150% moderate, duplication severe. 
We have mice with three times normal levels, as well as human, those are quite severe. So it's a, the brain is exquisitely sensitive to the level of this protein. And I dare to say there are gonna be people with probably 10 to 15% change on either side that may present with late onset psychiatric features. Because remember, with the 30%, we're seeing a phenotype in a mouse early on. So that suggests that perhaps some of those would be later. So the first thing we tackled is the duplication disorder. It's easier to reduce a protein than to replace a protein. So we asked in our duplication mouse model, would normalizing the protein in an adult mouse reverse the symptoms of the disease? And for this, we used an ASO, and now you know this is a target when you form heteroduplex. RNA is H well degraded, and you reduce the protein. And I'm just gonna summarize all the behaviors in these mice were rescued. They were all reversed. I'll just show you a couple of examples. You'll see here that the duplication mice are hypoactive. This is a group of mice. And when we give the ASO, their activity normalizes. The same rearing uh, on their hind legs, entering the center, everything normalizes. And here's the data from a single mouse. This is a wild type mouse. This is transgenic mouse and here on the ASO. So that was nice. We did this at about two to three months of age, but I wanted to see what happens if I waited till the mouse were seven to nine months of age, just before they die, because at that time they have, all day on, long they have seizures. So we decided to take a group of mice that were seven to nine months old and treat them with the ASO, and this is their EEG, quite abnormal, constantly having seizures. And within four weeks of the treatment, the EEG abnormalities stop. And all the seizures clinically stop thereafter. So this was the first proof of concept that perhaps an ASO might work for this disease. But in our mouse, we had an endogenous mouse gene and an added human gene. That's not good enough proof of concept data for clinical translation, you need to now make a mouse with two human genes. Because what if you overshoot, you give them Rett syndrome. So we recreated a new mouse model with two human genes and gave the treatment. And in this one, we've done a lot more in-depth studies week by week to see what's the first thing that reverse. Can you monitor a biomarker so that you know you treated just the right amount? And I'm just summarizing these data here where the MACP2 RNA is the first to correct, the protein corrects by the second week, and then all the transcriptional changes I've showed you begin to correct by two weeks, and they're almost totally corrected almost uh, six weeks later. But what was interesting, you don't get any behavioral rescue till about eight weeks of age. So this is important because when you're designing a clinical trial, don't expect improvement early on. I don't know what this will translate in a human. It could be months, it could be years, but it tells us that the neurons have to get everything back to normal with all the transcription changes before you even begin to see behavioral rescue. And it also tells us we have time if we overdose and we find some biomarkers totally overcorrected, you have time to give an antisense to the antisense in reverse. So this work has now led to the true proof of concept to move into the clinic, and Ionis is performing the clinical trial readiness. Now I wanna switch to the neurobiological studies we've done. These were the molecular. Um, Rett syndrome is a very complex phenotype. You see here all the features you see from the disease. When we started, we thought naively, maybe a particular neuron is driving the phenotype, and maybe if we figured it out, we'll target that neuron. So multiple different lab members did specific deletion in different specific cell types, and to our surprise, you would reproduce one or two phenotypes. And sometimes we would learn that this protein is critical for regulating feeding behavior. If you didn't have a good functional copy of this protein, you will eat uncontrollably, become overweight, severely overweight. And we have the patients with the hypomorphic allele who can go to the refrigerator, they're massively overweight. They, in fact, after we published the hypothalamus knockout paper, the family drove from St. Louis to Houston for me to see these 
kids. So it is important for every neuron. And we quickly realize it's not just it's important for the neuron, there's crosstalk between the neurons. When we knocked it out in inhibitory neurons, which make about 20% of all uh, neurons, almost all the features of the syndrome were reproduced. But when we corrected it, the animals got better for a few weeks, and then they crashed. And the same with the glutamatergic. So it's really the circuit needs it in every cell to be working. And that led us to explore some circuit studies, and I'll share with you very briefly some of these studies. This is work by fantastic postdoc Len Ji He, who wanted to see what does the neuronal activity look like in these mice when they are undergoing a learning and behavior paradigm. So you put a mouse in a cage, you give it a gentle foot shock, and then you check its recall in one hour, it should freeze if you put it back in the same cage. In a neutral cage, it will not freeze. And if you bring it back a day later, it remembers the bad cage where it got the foot shock, it'll freeze again if it has good memory. So we did that while recording from these cells, and you'll see that the wild-type animal freeze. The red animals, within an hour, they do okay, but by one day, they can't really remember well. The neutral, of course, has no effect. So I, this will take an hour to tell you all the data. Pardon me for just summarizing what we learned. What we discovered is that this, the network is really different between the wild-type animals and the red animals. While sparse neuronal activity becomes consolidated every time the animal has to recall the one day, in red mice, the network is much more interconnected and a lot more neurons fire together and fire together and don't get refined. So we're seeing that, and this was uh, the work of Lin Ji, but Matt Codell did all the computational analysis. Seeing that and the failure of the ability of the uh, mice to remember long-term because of this highly connected larger ensemble, we wanted to get to what is driving that. And for that, we did multicellular recording with the help of my colleague Shaolong Zhang. And I'll summarize again here what we learn. We discovered that these inhibitory neurons, the uh, Orion's loconosum molecularity, these are right near the CA1 neurons. They get uh, typically uh, excitatory input from the pyramidal cells. And that input is pretty healthy in the wild type animals. But in the mutant animals, they decrease less excitatory input. And in turn, their feedback inhibition is decreased. So you can imagine this is going to lead to a lot more active CA1 neurons because there is not enough feedback inhibition. So we tested that hypothesis by activating the OLM neurons, somatostatin neurons, with uh, the dreads. And once we corrected that and increased the feedback inhibition, now the network became similar to the wild type, and the animals have great recall. But what this told us is that if we're really going to fix Rett syndrome neurobiologically, we're going to have to stimulate all the cells. And one thing I failed to mention to you, when we did these conditional knockout and studied the properties of neurons, what we learned is anytime you take this protein from a neuron, you dampen the activity or the response of this neuron by 30%. So it's still active, it still functions, but everything is decreased. It's dampened by about GABA signaling is decreased by 30%, glutamatergic signaling by 30%. So it's there, but reduced. So this, is, uh, this prompted us to explore deep brain stimulation, because there you can stimulate both the whole circuit and in collaboration with Jean Rong Tang, uh, my colleague at the Institute, and Shuang Hao in his lab, they adopted one region of the brain, in the forebrain, the fornix, which has projection to the CA1 neurons and can hence enhance the activity of the hippocampus as a site for deep brain stimulation. And for this, they use the same parameters. Human studies stimulate this region. This region is being tested in adult onset dementia to see if you can improve learning and memory in adults. So it's being done in humans. And what was really nice is this improved all hippocampal phenotypes, basically. Uh, not only learning and memory on multiple tests, 
uh, Morris Water Maze, contextual fear, all of that, but it also uh, corrected the synchrony that I just showed you, the abnormal synchrony. It also corrected LTP, the plasticity. It increased, we have decreased neurogenesis in the rat mice. It normalized neurogenesis and it also restored the gene expression changes. So this is exciting, and our neurosurgeons are ready to do this. I am nervous doing this, mostly because re learning and memory is one phenotype, and there are 10 other phenotypes, and motor is severe. So I ask them patients that we can do motor deep brain stimulation, and those studies are ongoing with the doors uh, in the striatum, and we see improvements, so maybe perhaps eventually, if we want to go that route, we can do two transducers, one for learning and memory and one for motor. But while doing all these studies, I was curious, what is this doing? What's the deep brain stimulation doing? Increasing the plasticity. And we know training can increase the plasticity, and we know there's so many features of RED. Could it be that if we intensely trained a person with Rett syndrome, could it be that maybe that would help? And we wanted to compare if that would work, whether we do it early or late in the, onset, in the disease. Because remember, in humans, there's about two to three years of normal development, and in the mice, it also takes a while for them to develop symptoms. So we started with the Rotorad, which Harry introduced you to. And in this particular case, the phenotype begins at 12 weeks. That's when the animals with red, these are females with red syndrome, begin to develop features, and it worsens. By 24 weeks, they cannot stay at all on the rod. And here, there's no degeneration. It's just the neurons, as I mentioned, have dampened function. And it's a four-day test. So we did basically two different groups. One where we trained every two weeks, early on, before in, uh, onset of symptoms, and when we give the same amount of training, but it's all bunched up post-symptomatically. And the results were really clear. Here's wild-type animal, they do very well. The naive rat mice fall immediately. Late training had a little bit of benefit, but nowhere as close as the early training. So early training really helped the mice. And we followed them for several months. For six months follow-up, they continued to do well, but then there was slight decline. So it's not perfect. It doesn't correct the brain, but it helped. Then we wanted to see would that help with learning and memory. And in this case, we used the Morris Water Maze, where they are in a pool with a hidden platform. There are cues on the wall. And you put them, and after four days, using the cues, they learn to go straight to the hidden platform. And then the day later, you take it out to see if they remember where it used to be, which of the four quadrants. So typically, wild-type animal, by four days, they'll dash to that platform, and they'll know where it is. But the rat mice, unfortunately, don't. And in this case, this phenotype happens early. It begins by six to seven weeks of age. So we really only had about six weeks to do early training. We didn't have much time. However, we managed to get two training sessions. And then, again, we bunched it up all after the same amount of training after symptoms. And here again, the results were very clear. You will see the wild-type animals in four days. They find the platform quickly. But the red mice, naive and red, they can't. Even if they're late trained, they can't. But if they're early trained, they do as well as naive, uh, early trained, or uh, sorry, early trained wild-type or late trained wild-type. So clearly, this early training also helping with acquisition of memory. They did as well as the healthy animals. And then when we took the platform out, again, the naive animal can't search the area, nor they're late, but the early trained do very well, uh, almost, not as quite as good as the wild type, but almost. And they search the right quadrant also a lot more than the naive and the late. What was interesting, we took the same animals and we put them through contextual fear, and they didn't do much good there. So it hinted to us that this training is getting those neurons engaged in the act to improve their plasticity. We did the physiology, and that was the case. Those neurons normalized, their dendritic arbors normalized. So we wanted to test the hypothesis. If we capture those neurons engaged in the Morrison water maze, and now not train them, but simply activate using dreads, 
uh, the activating dread, giving them CNO, what will happen? And you'll see here, if we just give M cherry, the rat mice can't find the platform. But if you put them once, and we use FOSTRAP to capture the labeled neurons now, the, uh, the neurons engage in the act, and we simply put them in their cage, but give CNO to stimulate these neurons. Now both the wild type and the uh, mutant mice do much better. So this told us that this training is really important, and this I'll just summarize here the data. The pre-symptomatic training improves both motor and learning deficit, delayed the onset of symptoms, and it's an task-specific neuronal benefit. And this suggests that pre-symptomatic training might help. So this is where I think we can really make a difference for people with Rett syndrome. Right now, the average age of diagnosis, even with the gene discovery, is three years. Because, you know, early on, if a girl is two years old and not walking very well, nobody thinks much about it. But I think that if we had newborn screening, we have almost three years of early training that these children could be put through. And that might delay the onset of symptoms till we have more definitive th therapies. And there are now discussions by the NIH and uh, people like the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative to think about if we can do a focused early diagnosis, perhaps neuron, uh, newborn screening, perhaps we can intervene and delay the onset of symptoms. So I would leave you with that and thank all those who've contributed to our RET work. Of course, you've heard about SCA1. Grateful to Harry and his team for that collaboration. But these are generations of trainees, really, who've worked on RET syndrome. And I'm most grateful to the patients and their families and to our funders and uh, our collaborators. And of course, we're working with Ionis for the therapy. And I thought, couldn't capture all the names, but I want you to see Ruthie Amir, who discovered the Rett syndrome mutation. And this is the lab currently. Uh, this is the most recent picture of the lab, and this is where we live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Huda. Are there any questions? <coughs> Hello. So you showed that uh, enhancing the activity of, with the CFOS trap uh, rec uh, recovers the uh, memory. So um, this might learn better to perform the, uh, the uh, water more response. Is this specific for, is this task specific yeah. or, okay. For the training, it's task specific. So for DBS, it was not task specific, it was region specific. Specific. So when we did the DBS to stimulate, you know, the fornix, which enhances the activity in the CA1 and the dentate gyrus, because we were recording from the dentate, there we saw all functions of the hippocampus improve because now you're stimulating everything. When you're doing training, only the neurons engaged in the task are doing better. So I am now advising families. The training that people do in physical therapy, they send the child for an hour and they may do different things within an hour. I don't think that would work for that. I think you should use an hour to focus on motor, maybe a different hour to focus on language or a different hour to focus on hand use. You need that repetition, repetition, repetition to enhance the plasticity. Uh, hi. I have a question actually. Uh, it's regarding the. Exp um, I mean, if, are there some uh, some of the genes that are regulated by MEGP2 that can be modulated as a therapeutic purpose? Great question. So, could we bypass the loss of this protein by upregulating one or two genes? I cannot tell you how much effort we put into that. Literally years of effort and very nice publications but they all are a band-aid. So for example, we found CRH is elevated and that contributes to anxiety. You can reduce CRH and that might help with the anxiety. But then there are many other things that will lead to anxiety. So with time, you would lose the benefit. I will give you this and that will help you per perhaps appreciate why this is almost impossible. Among all the target genes, there are dozens of genes that each one alone cause 
neurodevelopmental disorders, cognitive dysfunction, autism, seizures, and so on. So there's so many things. You'll have to almost add or repair the levels of dozens of genes to do that. This is why I think it's either you modulate the protein itself, and because about 75% of the mutation make a protein that either has decreased binding activity to the DNA or its levels are lower, we are pursuing strategies in the lab to increase the protein. This is one of the strategies we're pursuing. And even it's mutant, maybe if you can increase it by 50 to 100%, you might get some benefit. And the other thing we're pursuing is circuit modulation. So who did, do the training or the dreads change protein levels? They don't change the protein level. The protein is still the same, abnormal, missing. It's actually a null. In particular, we used a null allele. So it's mosaic for a null allele. So that... And they don't miscellaneously change other targets or something weird? They do not. They do not. All, they just that's change... That's why I think it's all circuit. Yes, they only change the dendritic arborization, the synaptic responsive, the excitatory postsynaptic currents, inhibitory postsynaptic currents in those neurons. Yeah. Yeah, Huda, I, I was just intrigued by uh, the fact that you could actually uh, have an effect of just DBS or CNO. So I, I wonder what does it imply regarding the mechanisms? Because uh, it must be, in a sense, it's quite unspecific and still you get an effect. So do you have any thoughts what could be the mechanisms that actually causes it? So to me, I think the neuronal mechanism is probably because you're having decreased activity of, uh, or responsiveness of the neurons, slightly decreased. We know that they have decreased dendritic arbors by the stimulation you are actually boosting the activity back to normal levels. And that's the, the, we did in vivo LTP. I did not have a chance to show it. It's beautifully normalized. It's just at normal level from the DBS. So that it is nonspecific, but in some ways it's aiding in what's missing, which is the decreased plasticity, decreased activity. But since it, since it outlasts the stimulation, there must be some LTP-like thing, right? Uh, so. Well, it doesn't out, I should mention here, the D-brain stimulation effect would last about nine weeks. So we did two hours and that lasted nine weeks and then the effect went away. So you have to probably, if you use DBS, you have to continue to do it. The training, because the pre-symptomatic training delayed the disease onset in the mice by six months, but still they began to go down. So even with the training, it's not gonna be a, the whole solution. It's a partial solution. Yeah, just uh, maybe a naive question, but uh, I understand you, you shifted from the example of uh, deep brain stimulation, and then you say for children you would uh, advocate training. Yes. Uh, the, the question is, are there instances where deep brain stimulation has been used on uh, 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 young children? Yes. And would, would this be, yeah, so it would be acceptable uh, by FDA uh, and FDA, so on. Yes, I, I think that I'll tell you the regions that are used in children, <clears throat> typically for epilepsy sometimes, because again, if you have decreased inhibition, the neurosurgeons have figured out that sometimes they could really stimulate in, the, in some areas of the basal ganglia and the striatum and help with epilepsy. The same for tremor. In the thalamus, they do a lot of stimulation there for tremors and movement. And sometimes they use it for dystonia. All of these are features in red. Uh, I think the area that hasn't been used in children is the fornix. It has been used in adults. It's very accessible. So my only hesitation to jump into deep brain stimulation is because there's so many other symptoms. If you do one region, what do you do with the other region? That's why I'm trying to be thoughtful and maybe if you can hit two regions, do surgery, hit two regions, you might get a lot more symptoms improved. And uh, the second question is, as uh, there is in Baylor, the fragile X mouse, of course. Right. Uh, has one... Uh, uh, tested whether uh, uh, deep brain simulation would, would help for, uh, uh, for the fragile X symptom, of course, here. 
Right. Relatively mild in the mouth, but uh, you know, still testable. Right. Great question. So we've tested the CDKL5 mice at Baylor. Uh, John Rong did that, and it helped. That one had a nice learning and memory deficit. He tried a couple of other mice where there was learning and memory deficit, but not the fra fragile X syndrome mouse. I don't know how robust is the learning and memory deficit in that mouse. That's he may have looked at the data and chose not to do it because maybe it's not yeah, a very it's, uh, it's very minimal. Uh, yeah, let's say it can be, but you yeah. need uh, enough mice and yes. uh, things like that. Yeah. yeah. But it is a good point, Jean Louis, in that this DBS of the fornix may be a treatment for multiple disorders that cause cognitive learning and memory issues irrespective of the genes. So that's one advantage to these network modulation strategies. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, I think it, you know, it makes sense that when you do the early training, a presymptomatic training it has a huge effect because maybe you're, you're hitting a point when the circuit is not mature yet and you can uh, improve on those deficits. But why do you think that you have such a great rescue when you actually do the genetic therapy or, or the changes at seven or uh, six or seven months, when in theory the circuit at that point is not right. going to change very much. The neurons are not going to change much. Great question. And actually, I think um, the most important uh, point to highlight that we reversed the disease in the duplication mice in adults and so benefit, and Adrian Bird reversed the disease in rat mice, also in adult mice, and show benefit. So both the loss and the gain is reversible in adult mature mice. And one more thing I would tell you, we've done a knockout of the gene in adult mature mice. These mice were three months old, we delete the gene, and they develop all the features of rat syndrome. What this tells us that this is a maintenance protein for neuronal function. It's not a protein that is essential for how the grossly the circuits are formed, how grossly the neurons migrate, find their place, make connections. It's really at the micro level, the dendritic arborization synapse to synapse connectivity that's altered, and it's important for maintaining that properly. So when you lose it, you lose that, but if you bring it back, Everything is there. The hardware is all there. You bring back this protein, it's a software problem the synapse develops. So that's why I think there's no degeneration. All the neurons are there. They're all formed. They're in the right place. They just don't make the nice synaptic connections or the responsiveness with their neurotransmitters as they should. Is, is the expression limited to neurons or is it also in any supporting cells, glia? Or it is in glia, but it's like one seventh the level of phosphorus. It's very low in glia. So I think there probably there's Gail Mendel showed that if she brings it back in glia, that there is improvement in the respiratory phenotype. So it is it has an, probably a function in glia. But I must say, if you take it out of inhibitory neurons, you get the full fledged phenotype, including the premature death in males. So you know all of these cells are important. Yeah. But one more thing, it's only important above the neck and in the spinal cord neuron because uh, Adrian did a very nice study where he knocked it out exclusively uh, in the peripheral tissue and there was no phenotype, yeah. Thank you so much, Huda. Please join me to uh, thank Huda again. And